Thank you. So first, let's start out with a, a round of applause for Karen and Hope, who've put this together. Right? And let's not forget that it's not the first time they've had a conference, and it's not the first time that uh, Karen has done something for the animals, right? 1990 is when you founded UPC? Yeah, 1990. Yeah, think of that, working for chickens <laughs> since 1990. It's an unlikely gig, but right? She, she stayed with it. Right, so it's amazing. It's just amazing. You know, anyone who's been an activist for very long, you just have to admire what Karen has done. It is astonishing. <clears throat> All right, so the intent of my talk is to uh, think about and go over and ponder how to make strong arguments to reach very different people. As activists, what works, uh, thinking about what works and what approaches to take. <clears throat> so I want to start out by saying you may hear me use the word animal. The reason I use animal is because if we talk about animals, we too often pretend that we are not animals. This is not a good thing. This is against what we are trying to do. So if we can use a word that specifically is not exclusive to other species, but instead, if, a, if, a, if an ape were to sign animal, they'd be saying, they would be including humans, so anyone but apes. So whoever uses the term animal, it's any species except the person who's speaking. So for me as an author, it really makes it easier to write than saying non-human animals or other than human animals, these long, cumbersome terms. But most importantly, when we're talking to other people, we can start out by defining our terms, by talking clearly, by using words that mean what we want them to mean. And using animals as if we were not animals is not helpful. So this is one way to avoid that. <clears throat> I want to take us on a little journey uh, to a meal with a friend who invites us out to eat. The arguments, the talks, the discussion should be familiar to many of you. All right, so away you go out to your meal, and your friend takes you to a burger joint because uh, the place you wanted to eat wasn't open or whatever. Something happened. You ended up at the burger joint, and you're looking at a limp piece of salad and wondering what the heck you're going to eat, and you're immediately outed as a vegan. So if you weren't out, you are now. And so your friend says, what on earth do you eat? And you take this opportunity to say that since you've gone vegan, you've discovered food. You found out that there are spices other than salt. You found out that people in other places in the world are eating foods. Who knew? <laughs> and you've even found out that now vegans have basically everything that anybody else is eating. So basically, you're eating everything plus more and better. So your friend then comes up with the question, why? Why would you do that? Why don't you just add all the vegan foods to the animal products? And even though we're living in a post-fact phase of our government, you say <laughs> compassion. You come right out with a simple, straightforward answer. And she accepts it. Now, the reason she accepts your answer and the reason this is a good answer is because there's these things called virtues. So you may have heard of a guy named Aristotle, though you've probably not met him. But he was the one who started working with virtues, who started telling us there's these things that are good for us to have. These are behaviors that we all want. So it's been around a long time, and they're widely accepted. So when we talk about living simply, when we talk about being compassionate, when we talk about being loving, these are just ways of behaving that people accept because it's part of our culture and, frankly, it's part of every culture. So use the word compassion, love, caring, simplicity. All of these are kind of no-brainers. People will accept them, will not challenge you. If you look at a list of the virtues, you can see how many of these are important to us as activists. Right? If you kind of go through the list, and I kind of pared out some that I thought, yep, if you think about being an uh, animal activist, there's no question that we need a lot of virtues. Justice, right? We care about what's going on. Courage. Where I live in Montana, right? I have to have a lot of courage to just go about and be myself. And the fact is, I'm not very courageous. I spend a lot of time eating at home. But <laughs> presumably, we, we need a lot of courage. I think of Karen with chickens starting in 1990. That takes guts, right? So we, and we have to be creative. We have to be curious. We have to be, uh, collect information. 
So these are things that we need to know about in order to help the animals. <clears throat> so then your friend asked, well, what about humane auctions? Why can't I just, you know, keep eating everything I'm eating but try to buy a little different? And this is where information is important. So right, she's thinking of buttercups and bedtime stories, and you're thinking of you know, the slaughter. They're all slaughtered the same. They're all transported the same. And frankly, if we treated human beings this way, none of us would even get to high school. Right? They're killed so young. So there is no humane treatment of the animals that we eat. It's simply not possible. It's an oxymoron. It's a lie. So having information is really important. And we can tell the person that there's no government regulations, that that so-called humane chicken probably grew up just about like every other chicken, only it costs you a little more to buy it. And then you say, anyway, even if we could raise them humanely, don't they have a right to life if, in as much as we do? And here you're drawing on something really important to remember, this idea of consistency. It's powerful. It's like the virtues. When you catch someone in inconsistency, they don't know what to do. Right? They kind of, they kind of withdraw and they, they don't know what to say because everyone recognizes, again, this is a philosophical principle. We have to be consistent. And people don't know that, but when you catch them in an inconsistency, you've got them. So watch for these inconsistencies, things like people being so interested in their own life while they're consuming other lives. Right? That's a little problematic when you pause to think about it. Most people don't pause to think about it. <clears throat> then your friend says, well, why about the dogs? Shouldn't they be voting? She, your friend has gone from not caring about the cow that she's eating to being very concerned about the fact that dogs can't vote. OK. So here you need to know about morally relevant distinctions. So there are differences that matter. A dog isn't part of our political system. A dog isn't interested in whether or not our cars have good emissions. I mean, physically, in the end, they're going to be. But this is our deal, not theirs. You know, children can't drive cars, and children can't vote, and no one brings that up when you talk about the right to life. Then your friend is suddenly worried about the carrots. Right? <laughs> what about the carrots? They matter too, don't they? Right? So again, morally relevant distinction. So what's that morally relevant distinction with, between carrots and other animals? Sentience. Sentience. Like, think about the central nervous system. And you know, people will bring this up because they just, they've never thought about it. But it's so easy to just say, look. You know, the fact that you mow your lawn doesn't seem to worry you too much. Don't you worry that that grass is screaming? Right? No, they're not worried. They get it. They get that mowing your lawn is very different than mowing over a bunch of animals with a lawn mower, right? They get it. So it's a ridiculous argument. And if, again, if you point out that they're being inconsistent, if you point out that there's a morally relevant distinction, you're good to go. Point out that the fish has a central nervous system. The fish feels. That's why the fish gasps and flops and tries to get away from you. Leave the fish alone. Eat the carrot. Your friend is feeling a little concerned that perhaps you're bringing up the point that her meal is not the best choice. She's feeling a little embarrassed, right? When you bring up points like compassion, she recognizes that if your meal's compassionate, hers may not be. So she falls back on the, the great plea of humanity, shouldn't people come first? All right, the dog can't vote, the carrot doesn't matter, but still. Shouldn't we put our energy into human beings? You know, you're thinking about factory farming and the circus and bullying and wars, and then you're remembering the loyal dog you've got and the cat that doesn't care about property, and you compare that to capitalism, consumerism. You're thinking, why, really? Why should humans come first? You don't say that, right? Right? You don't say that. You instead are well informed, and you say, yes. People are really, really important. And therefore, we need to change our diet. Because when we oppress animals, other animals, I'm sorry, when we oppress animals, we're oppressing people as well. First, you point out how our medical bills and our health is affected. People aren't dying from eating broccoli and tofu, right? Our leading killers are all from animal products. They're all from the, the beings that we're killing and consuming. And then you point out that while there's 900 million people who are hungry, we're th feeding 635 million tons of grain to animals, factory farmed animals. That 70% of the grain that we harvest goes
goes right into our factory farms and right down the gillets of animals who don't want to be exploited, who don't want to be fed that grain, who don't want to be slaughtered when they're in their adolescence. And that we lose 90% of the protein and the calories while people are hungry. Right? So this is a powerful argument. People who are truly cared, people who are truly concerned about other people have to think about this. And when you're at a conference on religions, this is a really strong argument. The environmental argument is powerful as well as the one of world hunger and oppressions in general. And so bringing up again, having the information and being able to say all the leading, the biggest and scariest environmental problems, all of them, the main cause, and you can look at her hamburger while you say it, is what we're eating. That we are consuming our earth. We are gobbling it up. Right? Greenhouse gas emissions, probably the scariest thing happening on our planet. Number one con contribution isn't planes, cars. <coughs> nope. It's the animal <coughs> industries. Freshwater pollution, freshwater reduction, soil degradation, deforestation. All of these. All of these really, if you love the earth, if you love life, if you care about people, these are really serious problems and they are smack up straight directly coming from our choice, our choice of diet. Remember, it always matters, choice. If people don't have a choice, move on to someone who has a choice, right? We don't want to pick on people who can't choose what they're eating. People need to have a choice. So then your friend's a little desperate. She says, fish, the fish. Okay, they're sentient, but if I could save the earth, shouldn't I eat the fish? You point out that you may not see what's going on in those seas. They are in a state of silent collapse, and even the, the Pew Commission on Oceans has admitted this. The scientists are admitting it. We've got about 30 years till the fishing industry is completely over. We've been fishing, we've been changing which fish we fish out of the sea for years because we're running out of fish. And in any case, as pointed out, they're sentient. If you could choose between a carrot and a fish and you're genuinely concerned about suffering or compassion or doing what's right, you're going to choose the carrot. So then you want to say to your human-loving person that you're talking to, we can only help people if we change what we're eating. It's the only way. So if you're sincere, rethink your diet. Now, there's one other thing. Huh, my slides are popping their words around a bit, but we don't mind. So there's, I use the term AMORE. It's an, an acronym. An acronym. Sorry, I always get the word wrong. And what I use it for is to remind myself of how to reach people where they are. So if I'm dealing with a person who only cares about people, using A, probably not my best choice. Right? They don't care. They're going to say, pass that milkshake over here. I don't care that the dairy cows are you know, suffering because you're stealing their calves. And I don't care that the chickens are living in cramp cages. Hand over the egg. Right? But you've got these other options. So this is where information is so important. You've got to be informed. <laughs> You need to say to yourself, medical health. Now, this person looks like someone who truly, you know, they're in their yoga outfit, and you can see they've got their mat tucked under their arm. <laughs> Health's probably a good place to go with them. Amore, what does it mean? Hmm. So it's an acronym that's easy to remember. Then the one that we need the most information on is probably oppression. But these, all of these uh, oppressions are linked, right? So the milking of the cows, the, repro the, the indifference to reproductive choices, right, carries over to feminism, right? The stealing of the young, which we would never tolerate in human mothers. Uh, the stealing of the reproductive powers and the ex exploitation of it. So, right, feminism plays in. You think of the workers that come across the border and don't have uh, English language and get ended up in slaughterhouses where they get injured and they don't have insurance, right? So, again, if you care about people, if you care about the planet, um, you, you need to change their diet. And of course, religions is in here as under the R. And it's the one that is most sadly ignored in our movement. So I'm delighted to see a whole conference. It's, you know, as, as, as you notice, two of my books are on this subject. This is an important subject. Talk about people who are called to care, right? Who have to care. Who, When you point out they're being cruel, they can't say, I don't care. I'm a Christian. I don't care. Right? You can't, it doesn't work. It's embarrassing. They can't do it. So religion is a really strong and great place to meet people where they are. So remember when you're dealing with humans that you have to kind of talk about what matters to them. 
So you have to be well enough informed that with regard to a change of diet, you have an idea where to, where to connect with them. So remember to define your terms, have that information under your belt, know about morally relevant uh, distinctions, know about sentience, that the central nervous system is the difference. Uh, remember the acronym AMORE, so you can talk about them in a way that's meaningful to them. Remember that you can catch them up in inconsistencies and remember to be consistent yourself. Uh, but also remember to be humble. We all make mistakes. I know I do. So your friend is desperate and has nothing else to say. And she pops the question. <laughs> but luckily, you are aware that this is a slow process. That you are not going to change the world tomorrow or even today. But we're going to be patient and we're going to take people where they are and we're going to come informed so that we have a chance of changing the world for animals. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Yes, please. What do you say when uh, it's, a proven, it's been proven and measured uh, that vegetables and uh, well, that plant life has feelings, has nervous reactions? Mm, I do hear this, indeed. I say to them that it is certainly possible that there is something going on with plants that we do not understand. But I'm going to define my terms. And when we talk about feeling, it has to do with the central nervous system. So until we discover something else, we're talking without meaning. And I know that there is uh, the studies that have been done. The most famous study with plant feeling could never be replicated. Right? The person that did it, no one else could ever reproduce it. So until people come up with very clear information and some mechanism, right? And we may need a different word for it, right? Because we, sentience is about a central nervous system, about the nerves and your brain and how they work together. And we know the plants don't have that. I'm very open to the idea that there may be something similar. But right now, it seems a little silly to complain about the carrot when you're eating a chicken. Yes, please. Yes, it's also true. Yes, if you care about the if you care about the plants, quit eating the animals. Mm -hmm. eating all the plants. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is: Do you think there is an optimal um, method when you are conversing with someone one on one? To is it better if you know this person and you know you're going to have lunch or dinner with that person again? Uh -huh. To just keep the little sound bite short and sweet and change the topic, or stay with them as long as yeah. they're willing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To I love this question. Here is what I think is the most important thing when you get invited out to eat or end up getting sucked into a discussion of diet when you hadn't planned it or when somebody invites you to it. My suggestion is be very clear at the outset they invited the conversation. Because what will happen is you will get to the end and they will say all you do is talk about diet. Right? You'll be accused of being a proselytizer and insensitive and ruining the meal and right and, and all you wanted to do was enjoy a meal so be very clear with them who brought up the subject then say to them if you want me to answer your question I'm happy to do so are you sure you want to talk about this <laughs> but and then then if they're into it I wouldn't miss my opportunity as long as they do I, I think pausing, I think giving them a chance to change the subject, I think letting them, letting them lead the conversation. Once the question's on the table, take it and run. Then let them lead again. Let them see you know, if they want to suddenly talk about the movie they saw last night. That's what they're ready for. That would be my thought. Yes, please. Culture, yeah. Yeah, and I was just in touch with a, some guy I didn't know who got a hold of me on, got a hold of me about this permaculture stuff and just had no interest because he was presumably environmentalist, but he had no interest in changing his diet completely to plant based because of the environmental effects. So for me, that ended the conversation. Like, 
if you're doing this permaculture because you think it's great for the environment and you're not willing to cut to have animal free foods, then you're not sincere. And that's where the consistency comes in. And I nailed him on the inconsistency and the conversation fizzled because he was not willing to give way at all. But I had pointed out he was being inconsistent and in saying he cared about the environment and was continuing to eat animals. So that's my best suggestion with that. Again, use that inconsistency thing with them. Sincerity. Make sure they're sincere. And if they're not, nail them. <laughs> Julie. Please. That's a great question. Should we keep it till it Please. Okay, so what about when people get angry? Where does it come from? How do you deal with it? Do you guys like that British accent or do you not hear it? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So anger and dealing with anger. I think that when we come from a truly compassionate place, we can get around a lot of that. And I remember back when I was younger and more of a flaming, right. I'm a little better now. At, I, I, it's been a long time since I made somebody angry in a conversation. And it's because I'm more easygoing and I truly am come from a more compassionate place. I get how fallible and clueless we all are staggering along through life and that it's chance when somebody bumps into you and brings the change that will make your life, your life better, the earth healthier, and animals will have a better chance at life. So I think our approach is really really important in preventing anger. Now, it doesn't mean you won't have any anger because people can get pretty desperate. And, and I think one, one way we're going to get anger is if we're being unjust ourselves. And that's why I say if you're dealing with somebody, for example, I think as a Caucasian, I need to not be approaching people, other people, people, people of different races that are in a racist culture. So people of color, better if I don't try to oppress them any further right in the way of saying, you need to do something different. Now, on the other hand, right, uh, uh, most of us in this room are going to say, I'll, and I remember when I said it at a conference, I'll go after anybody that's hurting, hurting animals. I will. But it's how you do it. So be, if you have a choice, you know, be sensitive, be aware of your own privilege, be aware of your own oppression uh, to people, be aware of other people, what they're suffering. Um, I think all those things, if we could really approach people with that knowledge and understanding. And I know how, how I feel when a man brings up the rape issue, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it just is like, how dare you, you know? It's not, it's not an analogy that men should be using any more than I should talk, be talking about slavery. And so that understanding really helps me to be sensitive to the fact that everybody comes from a different place and if it's not your reality, Stay out of it and be sensitive. But, but I think it, thinking about if we create anger, my suggestion is step back. Maybe apologize. Maybe say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Um, what are you thinking? You know, and give them a chance to give you feedback. And I think you would gain so many points if we would do that. Back up and apologize because you hit a nerve. And even if it's just the nerve of I want to eat my hamburger, you know, you still need to back up and give them a chance to, to express themselves. See where you can go with it. If you're going to move forward, I think you have to acknowledge the anger and the hurt, which is usually behind the anger, the fear, and deal with those sensitively. It's a great question, though, and we will all see it, right? We will all see it, especially if we're young activists. Oh, gosh. Which book covers today? None of them. <laughs> All of them, maybe, is a better approach, right? Um, this is the one that looks, what this book does is it looks at um, how all the positive points. If you're, if you're within a religion, there is just no way that you can make an argument for continuing what we're doing. You just can't. So this book goes through each of the religions and points out all the points that make it completely impossible to carry on. And it's one of my backgrounds. I have a degree in comparative religion. So my master's is in that. My doctor's it, it is in philosophy. So the two have worked really well. This one is voices from different people. 
in religious traditions talking about uh, the call to compassion. And then I have a couple. I have one on bears and one on primates. So if you're interested in those animals specifically, this one will help look at oppressions. So talking about the different links between you know, people, people of color, women, poor, classism, all of them. Uh, there's some ableism uh, discussion in there. And these are the two on environment. So if, if you need that information, if you need to understand how you talk to someone who's an environmentalist, they are great allies, but they're not, right? We have to help them to be good allies. They are completely our allies. They just don't know that yet. But right, we have to have the information, right? Or, or they're not going to get it. We have to get it first. We have to reach out. And the one on top is the book um, on the philosophers, Reagan, Singer, and the arguments kind of behind it. So that's what the different books are about, whichever might interest you. And I actually, you will not find them cheaper. I make no profit on them, and I get them cheaper from the publisher. So if you want to get them from me, now's a good time. Yeah. <coughs> Right. Yes. Good. Bingo. Right. Okay. So, how do we deal with media specifically, and the fact that this <coughs> restaurant? So, I live in Montana, right? So this is, right? This is just my life. It's just no one. When I moved there, none of my students knew what vegan was. Now, it's rare to find a student who doesn't know what vegan is. And I have 120 students every semester. I've been there for 15 years. That affects that community. So our advocacy matters. It absolutely matters. And I, I, there's things you can do. Like I know somebody who made little cards that said, thank you for serving vegan food, and would leave them in the, in the restaurant so that they know they had a vegan in there. I know when I go out to eat, I, um, and there's different ways, right? There's a soft approach that if they're willing to accommodate you and take out several things and charge you the same amount, right? People are happy with that. I'm not happy with that, right? <laughs> If you don't have vegan food on your menu, I'm not going to eat there. That's all there is to it. You either serve vegans or you don't. And I will make a point, even if I wasn't. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm not hungry, I'll go in and say, so what you got that's vegan, right? It's my way of making them aware there's vegans in the community, right? They say, we haven't got anything. Oh, OK, thank you. I'll go look somewhere else, right? And I wasn't going to eat anyway. But the point is I went in there <laughs> and made it clear to them that having a vegan dish would be a really good thing. So there's things that we can do, being proactive, being out there. Um, having, knowing ourselves, what do we want to do if they don't have anything? Am I willing to let them know, am I, if they're cooking my vegan burger on the same grill they took, they cooked the last burger, is that okay with me, right? So, and, and talking to them about it, like they say, well, we do have a vegan option. Okay, are you going to cook it in the same spot, right? And they get, they're like, who cares about that? What kind of a nut is this? But right, you can point out to them that, you know, if you were, if this was a matter of health, right? That, that maybe I'm going to have a reaction because you've got some of that lactose in my, in my cup, right? So making them aware that this is as important as any other eating issue on the table. They just don't know about it. But you do, and that's your deal. And if they're going to feed you, they need to be aware of it. So leave some cards. Ask for what you want. Talk to them. Don't, do not rush the process. When you've got them there and you're asking about their food, don't miss a chance to say a few extra things, right? That's our advocacy, right? This is why I eat vegan. Do you have anything that's animal free, that's suffering, that I can feel like I'm not causing as much suffering? Right? Something that's environmentally more sound. Right? Don't miss your chances, please. So you said there is a movement that's been going on for a number of years now to help the veterans return with PTSD to mm -hmm. the local farm and work with the farm and mm -hmm. Right, right. If you change, change them into vegans, mm -hmm. how does that possibly take the hostility or the fight out of them if they get called up again? Right, right, right. The violence, seeing the world differently. That is such an, uh, uh, that's a really important question that you bring up for several reasons. And the main one I want to come back to is being sensitive to others and where they're at, right? Don't be insensitive to a bunch of veterans that are working in a place of cruelty. Um, they're not your best target, right? It's a minority. They are suffering. Um, they're a mess. My sister works with vets. She's a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And, you know, don't add to other people's oppression. If you deal with vets, listen to them. Talk to them in a way that is sensitive to their point of view. Make sure you hear them. So that's a really, uh, a really good question. And one of the things we can do as advocates, we need to be asking our wonderful sanctuaries if they're reaching out. 
if they're reaching out to our vets in the community and inviting them, if we have the same kind of program, why wouldn't we have the same kind of programs, right? Well, because I think because media now with what's been going on with the pipeline and so forth, oh, God. that's a connecting back to that. Yes, yes, American. yes. Uh-huh. So that might be the mm -hmm. media that mm -hmm. has been Sure would. It's a great thought. It's a great thought. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Boy, please. How much time have we got left for questions? Where are we? Uh, awesome. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're cutting out. They might go to a family a function, but after the meal, it's completely. So they take the pledge. I just will never. Kim, that's a great question. It's a great question. And, you know, I'm asking all of for right. selfish reasons. Like, I feel bad that I, I just don't want to cut certain people out. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to put myself to our power and maybe the difference. Yes. And again, you're quite right. This is a very divided issue. My take is come from a place of compassion, whatever you do. Right? So for you, what does that mean? I lost my father about two months ago. It's still painful for me. So. Yeah, so we have to come from a place of love. But I will say that my father said to me, and my sister, he said, I wouldn't have lived so long if you two hadn't, hadn't changed my diet, right? He would have died. He lived to 86. And right up until he was 85, he was walking and leading the, taking the dog out. And he had a great life. And one of the reasons was because my sister and I went vegan so young. We've been vegan so long, and we'd always, you know, we would come home. And we, you know, and they were great. Their mom's basic, everything she cooked for us when we were kids, you know, that had to hurt her. But we were too young to know it. Right? So we just say, we don't eat that anymore, right? We were just clueless and insensitive. And <laughs> I look back on that, and I'm horrified, right? So just try to be sensitive to your mother has fed you since you were a child. And these foods that you love, that mattered to her. So being compassionate requires such a big picture. It requires so much, um, I don't know, just not being in your own little world. And it's much harder when you're young, right? You don't always have that perspective. So also just knowing that. That's just how it is. And, and mothers get that. Their kids are clueless and insensitive and, and passionate about things. And <laughs> so the world goes around, right? So all I can suggest is whatever you choose, go from a place of compassion. Please. So I think that I'm really doing this, trying to do this with, you know, from a place of compassion. I've been a vegan for 35 years. And awesome. Also from top of college. And my students know what vegan is. Yes. Right. I I will sit down and have a meal with someone who's eating meat, but um, I try not to. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'll yeah. take my brother's kids with the beach, my brother was eating and I said, you know, when we go out to eat and the restaurant they have no food and they tell me, you know, could you have yeah. like some food? He said, No right. problem. Right. You know, so sometimes awesome. I'm about that. That's you know, cool. Be, yeah. Exercise is one thing. And you know, for me, I don't eat with people. I say, let's go for a walk. Somebody will say, let's go for tea. I say, no, let's go for a walk. And I know that walking is it's a time when I process. And I make a point of getting out. And I'm lucky I'm blessed with doggies that look after me. So my doggies take me out for walks. And I'm the love, their love, and their, you know, just that presence. And I know it's healing. 35 years, it's about how long I have been a vegan. And, and yeah, you carry a lot of pain. And living in Montana, I'm close to the pain, right? I see the cattle. I watch their babies. They're being born now. I'll watch them grow up. I'll watch them go away. I'll see them go away in those trucks. And, and I, I, um, I just think for me, what I do is what are, the, what are the things that bring happiness? Doggies, walking, the trees, go out and sit in the yard, friends. Right, so knowing what you need to do to look after yourself and making sure you do it, watching for things like anger. When you start to get angry, you need to back up. You need to say, do I need to take a break? How do I, how do I heal this? And we as activists, we need to look after ourselves. This is an exhausting, uh, sad, and, and I know I don't watch 
sad videos ever, and I haven't for years. If you're vegan, don't watch things that are sad. Don't look at the chicken when you're looking at the beautiful magazine that Karen puts together. Know which parts are for you and which parts are for other readers, right? Protect yourself. It's also a good question. Please. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate your, your thoughts on this. Um, and I appreciated your mnemonic. I, I, I mean, I, in, in Los Angeles, cosmopolitan area, a lot of cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. And with culture comes a lot of eating practices. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I mean, on a larger level, the comment about the veterans, um, I think we, we forget just how much people have created a life for themselves that is centered around their diet of eating meat. And so how do we bring, I, I appreciate when you said specifically that we need to uh, you know, pay attention to what their world is. Yes, absolutely. So how do we grapple with the fact that in addition to the five that you mentioned, Mm -hmm. the, there's something about their suffering or their... That's part of the oppression. That's under the O, so that cultural difference. So not just outside oppression, but not the oppression of uh, workers at the factory farm, but you're talking about... Racism, ableism, classism, sexism, all of those. That those are out there and they're linked and they're things we need to be aware of and sensitive to. We have to know who we are. As a female, I'm definitely, you know, I'm not, I'm not at the height of privilege. As a Caucasian, I certainly am. And knowing that, and you know, the thing, the world's a huge place. Why would we target a minority community, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. There's far more people that look like me, but then again, I come from Billings, right? Pretty much everybody looks like me, <laughs> right? So you live in a very different world than I do. And I guess my take on that would be if I had a friend, if I knew someone, or if someone approached me, but I would never approach somebody from a, a, from a community that I feel my somebody who looks like me is oppressed. Why would I when I have so many that look like me that are busy chowing down on chickens and pigs and cows, right? That's just not where I would go. I would leave that to people inside the community at, in as much as I can. When they come to me, fine. If they're my friends and ask me, fine. Does that answer? Yeah, I mean, it's a struggle in, in I mean, I work in a, in a union building. <laughs> Probably, you know, 1% of the people are vegan or close yeah. to vegan. Right. Yeah. At least you can say the building, right? I live in a state where, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Worried about your building, right? But I hear you. Yeah, out, let, yeah. Talk to your friends. That's where you start, I think. Please. Uh, some people talk about using hillsides for grazing cattle for food, with the mm -hmm. idea that uh, they're not going to be. There's not going to be agriculture there. They're not going to plant carrot fields there on those hillsides, so that if you're concerned about Right. Nonsense. Nonsense. Right. So we feed 70% of our grains to cattle, right? And you can say the argument of grazing, but when they're grazing, methane, right? The, the, the grass-fed cow is far worse for climate change. Far worse. Incrementally worse. So you have that to think about. And what would be wrong with just leaving that land alone? Wouldn't we like a frog to live there? Just as an example, right? So the question is, why do we have to use every bit of land? Just because we can't plant carrots there doesn't mean it isn't important in its own right. What we do know is by eating uh, animal-free, we protect our environment. And so if you're worried about how to use the environment, use, you know, it's not ours. We're sharing this planet. And if you can leave a piece of land alone by choosing a different diet, wouldn't that be the best option? I guess that's what I would say to them. Please. Yeah, the way I don't socialize with people. <laughs> yeah, it's made a huge difference. But I will say that um, right, oftentimes, especially if you come to being a vegan early, there's something a little different about you anyway, right? And I didn't fit in well anyway, so I was always the quiet, kind of strange child. So um, I don't know whether it gave me, I'll tell you the main thing for me from that answer. It gives my life purpose. It has, uh, when I see people, they have to have kids because they don't know what else to do, right? If I don't have kids, what am I gonna do, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm not too worried about that. I have got a lot of work to do. 
And I recognize that people are having children because they don't know what else to do. And it's an endless regress. And the kids have to figure out how they're going to find meaning. OK, let's have kids. right? And this is the planet's struggle. This is our struggle. So for me, being a vegan has given me um, a life that is beyond myself. Because I'm going to be dead soon, right? I don't matter that much. But if I can make the world a little better, then it makes me feel like maybe Maybe I wasn't so bad being here, right? I didn't just wreck things. I, I tried to do something good. <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely also, you know, yeah, the pain that, that was brought up. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things about it. You know, if I my dad always said, Lisa, can't you be a little more normal? And my <laughs> and my one of my friends, I started fasting about 20 years ago. I got sick of Thanksgiving, so I'd start fasting on Wednesday, and I'd fast through the day of slaughter, and I'd fast through the day of feasting. One of my friends just pointed out, you know, at least can you do anything else to exclude yourself from the world that you're <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking about it. Maybe I can. It has an effect. But a lot of it's good. I would say the majority is good. I wouldn't change it. Who had a hand up? Anybody else that hasn't asked a question? Yes, please. Yeah, please, yes. Um, so you start your, your talk with the word compassion. And mm. um, I Congratulations. Um, and I'm from Mexico City, um, mm -hmm. so I, I, I almost never use value-based arguments um, mm -hmm. when I talk about veganism, because at least um, coming from a cultural context where caring about animals is as mm -hmm. far removed from your um, experience as, as, as it could possibly be, I think, um, it is very hard to convince people Right. Um, so, you know, in communities that already have vast difference with my political leanings in terms of human rights, mm -hmm. um, it is even harder to make a moral argument about um, animal rights. So I mm -hmm. usually try to go with fact-based, almost self-serving arguments, um, be it your health and the health of your children, or the health of, you know... Did you perchance come in a bit late? Did you, by chance, come in a little late? No, 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 I didn't. But you saw that I covered that, right? Well, I did. But my question, my question to you is why, um, like, for people with whom we do not even share enough language and background understanding to make a compassionate um, or value-based argument, mm -hmm. um, why would that even be, um, like, a big part of our repertoire when we're trying to reach not only the weirdos, the people with one foot out the door, who already are listening um, to our message, but those people that are at the margins and you know even even harder to catch. So I'm I'm, I'm really confused as to why value-based arguments are it seem to be at the foundation um, of our opening statements, and we're not looking at the fact-based, um, the numbers like the hard data that are undeniable. I don't. I think they're all, they're all depends on the person. This is where you reach people where they're at, right? The, environmental, the environmentalist isn't interested at all in compassion, right? So that's why with environmentalists, you need the information on the environment and how our diets affect the environment. When you have, uh, you, you have to meet people where they're at. And compassion is absolutely. I think from where we come from, I think it should be the core. Um, I think it should be our core, but that doesn't mean it's the core of what we present to others. You meet people where they're at. If you're dealing with a scientist, forget the compassion. Go with whatever else. You know, you've got a mora. You've got the suffering, the medical, the oppression, the religions, and the environment. And if you're dealing with a religious person, go straight to religion, right? <laughs> that's, that's a no-brainer. Karen. Yes. So the yes. idea of just sticking and staying in a static way with people where they're at, I don't think it's, we, right. I mean, by definition, that doesn't advance Correct. their consciousness, Absolutely. their awareness, yes. and certainly our job as animal advocates. Yes. And whether, whatever a group we're talking about, we would never say, well, this is where they are mm -hmm. at in Mississippi, yeah. so we're going to explain why Jim Crow or right. African-American slavery right. is bad for the environment right. or right. Uh, hurts 
works the economy, but right. we're not going to talk about the morality yes. of it because yes. that's not where they're at. Yes. Now, clearly that argument is self-defeating. Yes. For all, for all when we talk about where people are at, it doesn't mean we're going to leave them there. It means yeah. we're going to figure out where to start with them to yeah. pull them out of their hole into a new space. Wait, because you've asked a question, I think, yes, please. Um, you can always catch me after. Mm -hmm. I cannot find one. Right. And it seems like the animal activist community as a whole. Why wouldn't that be cool? There is the new regional cool. bank, which humane banking and gives to right. charities and stuff. Yes. Like that yes. Humane. Yes. But, and does meet with Monday. Well, who of the professionals have approached the ones who are playing? That's a great idea. Global Alliance for Banking on Yeah, I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. But they all support animal agriculture. Yeah. Isn't that the root cause that we should it have? It is. It is. Most of us are not much money people, right? And so that hasn't happened, but that's a great, you know? I talked to Ingrid Winkler, you know, Paul McCartney's their poster child, and I said, Peter Pollen money. Yeah. What if the Bank of Paul McCartney does not want to have Yeah, yeah. Somehow it seems like we should as a group. I like it. I like it. Good idea. Take the lead. Yeah, make it, make it happen. Okay. I'm not a leader. I'm not. If you, if, Anyone, anyone who has anything more, please, I'm available. Catch me at my table. Catch me wherever you see me. I'm happy to talk to you about anything else. Thank you.